YouTube the other day and I saw the posters for the book. The only happens with Earth, coming soon. <laughs> it's, it's a terrifying message, even in the advert itself. This is a scary book. Are you trying to scare us? And if so, why? Yeah, that's one of the purposes of the book. But my main impulse is really just to tell the truth. So when I started digging into climate change science two or three years ago, I saw a great gap between the news from the academic research and the way that that story was being told in the media. Things were much scarier when I talked to academics off the record, when I talked to scientists off the record, than they appeared to be reading newspapers and watching television. There were sort of three main divergences. One was about the speed of change. We had been sort of led to believe that climate change was quite slow, that it would only be coming decades down the road, maybe centuries down the road. In fact, more than half of all of the emissions that we've put into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels have come in the last 25 years. So we're really doing this damage very much in real time. We were also kind of confused about um, the scope of the, of the threat, which is to say we understood sea level rise and um, we're worried about that, but we didn't understand how it would be impacting life far from the coastline in terms of economic growth, in terms of agricultural yield, in terms of wildfires even. A few years ago, we hadn't really thought about these factors. And we also were misguided about the possible severity of the challenge, which is to say most scientists understood two degrees of warming as the threshold of catastrophe. That's what they talked about. And that meant that the public understood two degrees as sort of a ceiling for what was possible with warming. And in fact, functionally, it's about a floor. We're on pace for about four degrees of warming, which would be, by the end of the century, which would be truly, truly catastrophic. And I saw a big gap between what the science said on each of those points and the way that the story was being told to the public. And I wanted to share that information mm -hmm. from the science with them. So that was my first main impulse, was just to tell the story. Um, and my impulse, that's, I'm a journalist, and my main um, imperative is truth-telling. and you know, to share the facts as I understand them. And I do think the book does that. But as I've written it, I've also become, as anybody does when they write about climate, sit with climate, a bit of a kind of quasi-activist, quasi-advocate. It's hard to look at this subject and not feel compelled to action. And so I also began thinking about how I was writing in regard to efficacy and in regard to messaging. And many scientists and their sort of colleagues in the press have often worried about this issue of whether um, writing an alarming, an alarmist version of the facts, write, writing that kind of text, writing that kind of piece, is um, runs the risk of alienating people, pushing people into fatalism, pushing people into despair, when in fact what we need is a much more engaged, active audience. And I think there are some people for whom that is true, who are at risk of falling into fatalism and despair. But when I look around the world, when I look, when I talk to my colleagues, when I talk to my family, when I just walk down the street every day, it seems so transparently the case to me that complacency is a much bigger problem than fatalism. And I know that from my own experience, as someone who was living a complacent life, as a you know relatively well-off cosmopolitan urbanite who didn't think too much about nature and what was happening to it until a few years ago, I was brought out of that complacency by fear. So I know personally that fear and alarmism can be valuable in that way. But I also know looking back on the history, you know, when you think about Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, that was a book that was attacked for being alarmist. In the US, it led to the establishment of the EPA, mm -hmm. the elimination of DDT, which is a huge um, step forward for, as an environmental cause. You know, the, the fight against nuclear proliferation, the fight against drunk driving, the fight against, you know, cigarette smoking. All of these things are public campaigns that have made use of fear and alarm to shake people up, to disrupt their daily lives in a way that make them really reconsider what they're doing. And I think that that lesson should be learned by people advocating about climate too. The UN recently came out with this major report in the fall, which I think was a big turning point in the way that scientists um, talked about the issue. It was much more alarmist in its tone than previous mm -hmm. reports from the IPCC. And they said that what we need to do to avert this catastrophic level of warming is a, we need a global mobilization at the scale of World War II. Now, as we know from history, World War II was not fought on the basis of optimism and hope. It was fought out of fear and alarm and panic. We had obviously some hopeful idea of what winning that war would mean. And it, similarly with climate, I think that um, positive messaging is valuable. Absolutely, it should be part of the toolkit. But for too long, I think we left the, um, the note of alarm out of the song of climate change. Sure. And um, I think that there is real use for it in addition to it being true. The science is truly alarming, which is why having spent two years in 
in the science, I'm so alarmed. Before we get into some of the very big questions you raised there, what is it, on, on your journey as you were learning more, what is it that alarmed you most? What hadn't you appreciated before about the climate change story that really struck home with you? Well, the, the main revelation to me was just how fast it was happening. So, you know, I mentioned more than half of the um, emissions that we've put into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels have come in the last 25 years. That alone is an astonishing fact, but when you consider that means that we've done more damage to the climate in the last 25 years than in all of human history before, even more astonishing. When you realize that that is the same amount of time that that's m since Al Gore published his first book on global warming, it's since the UN established its IPCC, which means that the world knew 25 years ago everything about the damage that we are now doing, and yet we went forward and did that damage anyway, which is horrifying looking back, and it's quite distressing looking forward because it suggests that knowledge is actually not enough to motivate action. That to me was really terrifying. You pointed out that there's an excellent line in the book, I think that really struck home to me, even as someone who's been reporting on this for a long time, the majority of emissions into the atmosphere have all happened since Seinfeld premiered. Yeah. Which is in Seems not that long recent ago. lifetime. Exactly. And I think that really struck a, a chord with me. Is there not the danger? This is coming back to this point about alarmism. I looked at me flicking through some of the chapter headings in the in the early part of the book. It's it's like the book of Revelation. These are, you know, it's flooding, it's heat death, it's it's famine that 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 confronts us. We are, as a society, used to people preaching doom, and we've got used to a way of dealing with we put our head down and we shuffle past. And we've got to get on with our lives. We've got kids to feed. We've got food to put on the table. We've got jobs to get to. We've got lives to lead. How do you get over that point? How do you get inside people's heads to convince them this is a terrifying prospect, but there is something we can do about it? Well, it's interesting you mentioned the book of Revelation because I think one of the amazing things about climate change is that it really is a drama unfolding at a theological scale. This is language that we're a little bit uncomfortable using as sort of modern members of the basically atheistic culture that we live in. But we have brought the planet from what was essentially a stable climate to the brink of real crisis in the space of a single generation. And we now have about the length of time of only a single generation to really avert the worst case scenarios. That is a kind of collective power that humans have never wielded before. And I think in a perverse way, the scale of the threat, that is to say, just how horrifying um, all of the possible outcomes for global warming, their, test, they, their testimony to just how much power we have over the environment. So while it is horrifying to contemplate what the world would look like at four degrees, it's also a reminder of just how much we can do collectively to shape the future of the planet. And every decade will determine the next decade's climate. This is not something that is binary. It's not a matter of passing a particular threshold beyond which it's all over and the whole world will burn. At every point, no matter how hot it gets, we will all still collectively have the power to avert future warming, um, avert more suffering, and make the planet a little bit cooler. That'll be true even at four degrees, which is will be is already hellish to contemplate. But it, at that point, we'll be a, we'll be able to avert five degrees and six degrees. And I think it's really important for everyone to understand that one of the central messages of climate change is that we own this system. We, we did the damage to it. We can undo the damage to it, theoretically. Um, everything about it, or nearly everything about it, is within our power. So when we look out, on our, out our windows and see on TV all this extreme weather pummeling the planet, this is our doing. It's not something out of our control, even though it seems out of control. We have written this story, and the story as it unfolds over the next decades, we will continue to write. Now, exactly what story we will write is an open question. I think that has a lot more to do with politics, social inertia, our culture, than it does with the science. And on those points, I'm, you know, some, depending on your perspective, I might seem pessimistic or optimistic. I think we will almost certainly not avoid two degrees of warming, but I also think we almost certainly won't get all the way to four degrees of warming. And where we fall in that spectrum is really entirely up to us. And to me, that's an empowering message rather than a distressing or despairing message. Now, you talked about this interests me a lot as somebody who's been reporting on climate change for 20 years. I am terrified by the prospect, similarly to you, yet I find myself at, at conflict with myself. I still take my family on foreign holidays on an aircraft. Yeah. I still drive a fossil fuel powered vehicle. We still consume in a way that I know is unsustainable for the planet. 
I don't have one child, I have three. Um, how, how do we ensure those societal shifts? How do we get there? We're all in a state of, sometimes I worry, a sort of collective denial of our responsibilities. I think and acting as individuals, I know if I stopped flying, it wouldn't make a tiny bit, it would make a minuscule, insignificant amount of difference on a planetary scale. How do we get over that fundamental societal problem? I think the answer is politics. I mean, I think that's what politics is for, is to live up to aspirations collectively that we can't live up to individually. That's why when we talk about taxation, we don't ask people to make donations and you know hand over half their salaries to philanthropy. We collectively say, this is the tax threshold that we want to impose on people because we collectively understand that this money should be redirected towards these goals. I think the same model holds true for climate. It's true that you know we could all lessen our carbon footprint. There's been a lot of talk recently about the impact of diet and travel, as you mentioned. I think people should take those steps if they feel compelled to. But as you say, I'm with you. These impacts at an individual level are trivial. The much more important impact is the impact you can have with your vote in electing people who really prioritize climate change, who are concerned about it as a sort of first order political imperative, not as a fifth or sixth order political imperative, which is the way that most even liberal politicians in the UK and the US have treated it and by mobilizing, organizing, and putting pressure on our existing policymakers to make sure that the environment in which we make those personal decisions about travel and diet and other things, the environment is governed by policy that makes each choice we make environmentally responsible. So that, you know, for instance, there's been a lot of talk about meat eating mm -hmm. and, and the impact on the climate. There are studies they're somewhat small scale. They haven't been um, shown at, at you know, uh, anything like a national level. But if you feed cows seaweed, you can cut their methane emissions by as much as 95 or 99 percent. Methane emissions are the only reason that beef is a, is a climate problem. So we could theoretically legislate all cattle farmers had to feed their cattle seaweed, and then we wouldn't have to worry about how many hamburgers we were eating. Mm -hmm. And I just think the impact of that kind of policy change so towers over anything that you and I can do in our individual lives that while it's it would be better if you and I behaved better and I'm as I say in the same boat as you are it's so much more important for us to be mobilizing and pushing for political change because change of the scale that we need is only possible at the policy level it just simply isn't possible for individuals to make that kind of difference on that note then how do we find ourselves now and how do you think we are now with Donald Trump in the White House, who's made his position on climate change more than explicitly clear. We have, I think, in Europe, a level of political division that is echoes what's going on in the US. And currently, I think it's fair to say we are too distracted with other things to be really concerning ourselves with the climate problem. In countries like Brazil, one of the great ascendant economies, the ones with so much left to protect now has elected a politician who likewise uh, wants to avoid climate change. This is a depressing time if you have the conviction that politics is the solution to this problem? Well, I think the most distressing news is really what I consider the failure of the Paris Accords. Um, you know, just a few years ago, we had a truly international, um, you know, cooperative system established that would um, push all of the nations of the world to act aggressively on climate. No major industrialized nation is on track to meet their commitments under the Paris Accords. And even if they did, we would still be in store for over three degrees of warming, mm -hmm. which is well beyond what all the scientists call the catastrophic level of warming. So on that level, things are really bad. And as you say, global politics does not seem at present to be moving in a direction that makes that kind of cooperation more possible. It seems less possible going forward. That's really distressing. Um, but when I look individually at the nations that we're talking about, I see a lot of signs for hope. I, in the US, just in the last three years, the number of people who believe that global warming is happening and the people who are concerned about global warming has jumped, 20, each of those categories has jumped 20% in just three years. Um, the number of people who are really concerned about global warming has jumped 8% just since March. So there is real movement on all of these points. And I think actually that last category is the most important one. It's not people who believe in warming, it's people who are really worried about it. I think there have been for decades now a large slice of the population who is concerned about it, but really at the bottom of their list of political priorities. And I think the more we stare straight in the face of this problem, we realize not only is it immediately pressing in a kind of existential sense, but it also governs everything else that we care about politically. If we're worried about economic inequality, 
within nations, but also between nations, if we're worried about conflict, or we're worried about even domestic violence, gender equality, all of these things have the footprint, the fingerprint of climate in them. Mm -hmm. And if we're really worried about addressing them directly, we also have to worry about addressing them through addressing climate change. I see movements like Extinction Rebellion, the Climate Strike Movement. I see a lot of really exciting grassroots, grassroots movement on climate across the world. I find that really exciting. I think that the pressure on our policymakers is growing. In the US, the Democratic Party, which until recently was nominally um, worried about climate change but had not put forward any meaningful legislation to address it, is now very much behind, as a party, this Green New Deal proposal, yeah. which embraces the goals that the UN put forward in October to have our carbon emissions by 2030. In fact, they want to beat that. They want to do. They want to get to zero emissions by 2030, which I think is basically impossible. But the fact that that is one of the that is the stated goal of one of the two major parties in the U.S. is major, major progress. It's still too slow. I think that things are not moving. This is fast what I was going to say. I mean, we're looking at what I what I can sort of see looking at my kids and, and looking at the concerns of younger people today. Within a generation, we will have a population of people who really are concerned about this issue. Yeah. To the point that I could see real political progress. But what you're telling us in this book is we don't have a generation to think about this problem. Yeah, you know, we should have started. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but we didn't. I mean, among other reasons, it would have been a lot easier to, to make the changes we needed yeah. if we started back then. But I think um, when we talk about geopolitics, the other factor that's really important is um, this is not an issue that is really, this is not a crisis that has been produced primarily by countries like the UK and the US and the rest of the EU. Um, those nations are responsible for the lion's share of historical emissions. Yeah. But if we think that we've gone from a basically stable climate to a crisis climate in 25 years, that is almost entirely the result of the industrialization of the developing world, and in particular, China. Mm -hmm. um, China is now responsible for a quarter of all global emissions, and I think will be determining the lion's share of our planet's future in the coming decades. So exactly how Xi Jinping acts on climate, how much he sticks to his new rhetorical commitments about green energy and a renewable future, a responsible future, and how much he continues to open new coal plants, what kind of climate standards he holds, the infrastructure projects that China is building across Africa and the Middle East to. These are all hugely important questions, probably more important than the internal politics of nations like the, e the US and the EU. And that's a little distressing as people in the nations that we're living in because ultimately, our, our power is limited. Um, but I also think that, you know, China is, sees itself as coming into power as a, a new empire. I don't think they want to preside over a burned world. I think they want to preside over a prosperous world so they can, um, they can profit from it. Mm -hmm. um, and I imagine that over the next decade or two, they will take much more aggressive action even than they're committed to now. And I'm thinking personally in the aftermath of the sort of collapse of the Paris Accords, that what we're likely to see as a solution is something that's put forward by a few leading wealthy nations rather than um, a truly global network of cooperation. So, for instance, a bilateral cooperative agreement between the, U the U.S. and China, um, perhaps investing in, in negative emissions technology, which mm -hmm. is the one sort of, it's a little bit of a moonshot. We have some of these technologies that we've tested at small scale. We don't know how they work at large scale. But if we really want to stabilize the climate, it's something might be the like, thing we need to. It, it is the to it is the thing we need. I, I think yeah. um, there is no way that we get below two degrees with conventional decarbonization. That is just replacing dirty energy with clean energy. Yeah. According to the IPCC, they ran 400 scenarios that got us below two degrees. 344 of them featured negative emissions. They later ran 116 scenarios. 108 of them featured negative emissions. And the ones that don't feature those negative emissions, it's such a precipitous drop that it almost can't be produced by So when policy. you say negative emissions here, you're, you're basically saying the only way we can meet that target set down at Paris now is to take carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere that's already there. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And that's... Um, and that was really, that was almost unthinkable a decade ago. People were saying, God, we hope it never comes to that because we yeah. don't really know how to do that bit. We're barely figuring out how to do it now, yeah. but we're, now, we're now in a position where we're dependent yeah. on it coming. I've got one final question for you. I think one of the big problems politically, we're talking about the importance of politics, about getting collective sort of change when it comes to how we behave as a, as a species. The traditional politics sort of puts environmentalism very firmly in the left wing camp. It's about collective responsibility. It's about sharing of the commons, acting in the interest of others. 
we see that clearly writ large in US politics. It's, it's, very, it's very similar here in the UK. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who is proudly right wing, interested in their personal responsibility, who shuns the ideas of environmentalism, because basically because of its politics, I think there's a lot that comes down to it. How would you speak to that person to communicate to them what you're warning of in this book and it's something that they can be enticed to doing something about? Well, I would say two big things. The first is that there is no escaping this. If it unfolds as we expect it to, there will be no life on earth that is untouched, and in fact, no aspect of life that will be untouched. This is the, one of the major themes of my book, is not just the science of warming and what it, you know, what it will do to us, but what it will mean to the way that we live, so it'll affect our storytelling, our culture, our relationship to technology and, and um, history and all that stuff. There's no, you, living far from the coastline or slightly in the northern latitudes or being wealthy will not be a protection against the ravages of warming, so everyone's in this together, that's one thing. But the more pointed, point I would make is that the research emerging from um, economics recently on what climate change will do to our um, societies is not just incredibly dramatic and horrifying, but it's a true reversal of what was the economic conventional wisdom as recently as a few years ago, which was that aggressive action on climate was going to be costly. Mm -hmm. It would mean foregoing some degree of economic growth. And for those people on the right who are really primarily oriented around that value, that meant putting off the problem longer, waiting for more growth and more technology to emerge to make the action cheaper. But in fact, the new research says very, very strongly that faster action on climate will bring economic rewards in the very short term. One big study said that just by 2030, fast action on climate could bring $26 trillion of economic benefit to the global economy by 2030. That's not very far away. That's an enormous amount of money. And if we don't do anything on climate, we could end up at the end of the century suffering economic impacts totaling above $600 trillion, mm -hmm. which is more than twice all the wealth that exists in the world today. Um, and we could have a global GDP that was 30% lower than it would be otherwise. That's an impact that's twice as deep as the Great Recession, and it would be permanent. So if you're oriented around the values of economic growth and prosperity, as I think many of on the right are, the, the logic there is very, very strong, and it's shifted that, in that direction very quickly. Faster action on climate is better for economic growth, not worse. I think that's a huge bit of news from the research. I think it hasn't yet filtered into the minds of our policymakers, and in particular those policymakers on the right. But I think over the next few years it will, and that's when we'll really start to see our politics shift. Fantastic. Um, well, it's been fantastic talking to you a little bit. I can't say it's been the most cheerful discussion <laughs> I've ever had, but a really worth, uh, important one and, and thought-provoking. Uh, David Wallace-Wells, author of Uninhabitable Earth, published next week uh, here in the UK. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me.